Um, I've been asked to talk about diagnosis and treatment, and what I was going to do was make some general points about diagnosis and review recent diagnostic developments, make some general points about treatment and talk about treatment possibilities, and then at the end give you a guide to maybe what you should ask the experts who try to sell you something. So, some general points about diagnosis. Well, the diagnostic process, if you present to a neurologist with one of these diseases, is, first of all, that the presentation is very non-specific. Uh, people who present with sporadic CJD uh, can present in ways very similar to many other diseases. So, obviously, the neurologist has to think of the possibility, and earlier on we had a bit of discussion about that. Having thought about the possibility, uh, there will be a range of possibilities and the neurologist has to exclude other possibilities. And then finally, having excluded those other possibilities, try to seek confirmation from tests. I heard the phrase diagnosis of exclusion in the meeting that we had beforehand. Uh, in my view, that's something that neurologists in general strongly disapprove of. Every diagnosis is actually a positive diagnosis. It's a one of inclusion. Uh, the exclusion is because you have a differential diagnosis, a set of diagnoses, and you have to exclude some of them, but then confirm the ones that remain. And as we discussed as well, sometimes the passage of time is helpful. And that is very difficult, I understand that, uh, for patients and their relatives. But the way that the illness evolves over time may be critically important in the diagnosis. I should also say that some tests that are done have two roles. Uh, one role is to exclude other diseases and another role is to act as a confirmation. So in the initial stages of these diseases, a brain MRI and a lumbar puncture to look at the spinal fluid is not specifically done to find abnormalities of CJD to confirm it, but because these are very important ways of excluding other more common and maybe treatable illnesses. Uh, abnormalities on brain MRI and CSF may be very important in that respect. If we turn to confirmatory tests, and I'm going over a bit of what's been said already, essentially one can have non-specific tests. They're not related to the basic disease mechanism, but by chance they happen to be very useful. On the other hand, they're essentially specific tests that are related to the basic disease mechanisms. And I'm not going to labour this point, but the essentially non-specific tests have traditionally been the EEG, the brain MRI and CSF-1433. And while I wouldn't uh, deny the utility of these investigations in certain specific clinical contexts, the most important thing is that the abnormalities seen in these tests can be seen in other diseases. And therefore, the utility in confirming CJD depends very much on the clinical context, not simply on the abnormality of the test. So if we turn to basic disease mechanisms, there are two, really. Uh, one has been around for quite a long time, uh, and that is the detection of a genetic mutation in genetic prion disease. So if you have something that looks like a prion disease, and particularly if you've got a family history of prion disease, finding the appropriate mutation on a genetic test is very, very specific, and uh, you really can't argue with that. However, outside of genetic disease, the essential specific test all relates to PRPC, SC rather, the scrapey abnormal form, as you heard from Brian. And this is the hallmark of the disease, the deposition and presence of this abnormal prion protein. So if you find it, it should be a very specific uh, finding. And effectively, most PRPSC, this abnormal prion protein, is in the brain. And therefore, if you want to confirm the diagnosis, you have to look at the brain, and therefore you may do a brain biopsy in life, which is not a simple undertaking and is rarely done, or you do it at autopsy, in which case the diagnosis is quite late. Now, you could look for PRPSC elsewhere in the body, and as you've heard already, traditionally, uh, variant CJD is known to affect other tissues in the body, and in particular, tissues like the tonsil. So tonsil biopsy has been a disease-specific test in variant CJD for some time. So I'm now going to turn to recent diagnostic developments. And they are, can be classed if in two groups, really. One is improved detection of PRPSC, and the second is simpler methods to obtain neural tissue. So if we look at improved detection, 
It is a fact that PRPSC can be found outside of the brain in sporadic CJD and other forms of CJD, not only variant CJD, but it's usually present in very low levels. And these levels are so low that our ordinary methods of detection are not good enough to detect them. However, if you could make these levels higher by amplifying them, then maybe they could become detectable. And Brian's touched on this already. Amplification, you might have a sample with a small amount of PRPSC, which is undetectable by normal methods. You amplify it until there's enough there to detect. And as you've also heard, this amplification is essentially a hijacking uh, of the autocatalytic conversion of prion protein. PRPC, when it meets PRPSC, is converted into more PRPSC. This is a disease mechanism, but it can be hijacked in the laboratory uh, to amplify PRPSC from people with illness. And again, I'm truncating this a bit, but there are two broad methods uh, that you can hear of, PMCA and RT-QUIC. There are some refinements of these methods which are sometimes given different names, but these are the two core methods. So if you're going to use these methods, what tissues could you use them on? Well, obviously you want more accessible tissues than brain and the whole, so spinal fluid obtained at lumbar puncture, blood, urine, and indeed skin have all been looked at. And certainly the key thing in use at the moment is the RT quick in spinal fluid in sporadic CJD. And you've heard a bit about this already, and it's probably the single biggest diagnostic advance uh, that I've seen in the diagnosis of sporadic CJD. Blood, uh, there are tests available which are pretty good for variant CJD, although interestingly not for sporadic CJD, and also urine tests which are pretty good for variant CJD, but not sporadic CJD. And as you heard from Brian, there are currently no living cases of variant CJD in the world, so these are not particularly in use at present. And then there's the interesting aspect of finding PRPSC in the skin, and this has been done, as far as I'm aware, in both sporadic and variant CJD, and you will hear a bit about this uh, later in the conference. So what about simpler methods to obtain neural tissue? And by that I mean simpler than looking at the brain. Well, one method which again you'll hear about uh, at this conference, is that uh, in order to smell, uh, things have to go up your nose and then they meet certain specialised neurons or nerve cells which deal with smell. And these are effectively outgrowths of the brain. So if you put a, a brush up into the nose, uh, you can indeed obtain certain nerve cells from the top of the nose, actual neural tissue. And then if you use amplification methods on these uh, uh, bits of uh, nerve tissue, uh, you may be able to detect PRPSC. So this is a, a relatively new and interesting development which you will hear more about. I think that I would like to make one very important point, however, that it doesn't matter how technically good any test is. They always need to be used in an appropriate person at an appropriate time. They're always only part of the clinical process. I thought I'd mention in passing that you may all be thinking, hmm, well, wait a minute, there's PRPSC in blood or urine or skin, we can detect it, is it a risk? Well, I'm going to make a few statements, but not to, to in too much detail. First of all, detecting abnormal PRP is not necessarily detecting infectivity. You cannot equate abnormal PRPSC with infectivity in a simple manner. And I think it's worthwhile mentioning that there's normal prion protein that we're all busily making at this moment in our body. There's abnormal prion protein which occurs in different forms. And then there's the infectious agent, the prion. And these things are not the same. Um, and I think sometimes people talk about them uh, in rather confusing, overlapping ways, but you need to keep them separate in your mind. And infectivity in experiments, uh, showing that you can indeed transmit uh, diseases in the laboratory, is not necessarily natural infection risk. In real-world human infection, there are all sorts of complications, like the actual dose of uh, the infectious matter, the route by which it's uh, trans uh, transmitted to the human person, and also the person's makeup, genetic and otherwise. 
And I think it's worth particularly emphasizing that there is no evidence, despite a lot of study over a long time, of ordinary infection with human prion diseases, even with intimate uh, human contact. So I'm going to turn to treatment and make some general comments about treatment. Well, obviously, everyone wants successful treatment, and it's, well, straightforward, isn't it? You give a treatment and see whether they get better or not. And I'm not going to argue with that general statement, but I thought I ought to at least qualify it. First of all, there are two treatment situations, one in which you treat somebody who is clinically ill, and the other in which you treat somebody who is not ill, but to prevent their becoming ill. And of course, in prion disease, the main feature here in prevention would be people who carry one of these mutations, as you've heard from uh, Brian, uh, and they are therefore at risk of developing disease in the future, and you might want to prevent it. But I think it's worth noting that a treatment that's affecting in one role, uh, such as clinical illness or prevention, may not be effective in the other role. Uh, they don't necessarily always belong together. So if you have a disease, uh, you then develop symptoms. And if you give treatment, the treatment may indeed affect the symptoms or it may affect the disease process or both. And what we're clearly interested in, uh, in the end, is a, a treatment that affects the disease process, actually stops the disease process happening, rather than simply treats the, the symptoms. However, it's not always easy to tell the difference, and I'll touch upon that again in a minute. You may give a treatment and see some kind of improvement, but actually what you're doing is simply treating the symptoms, not the disease. If you do affect the disease process, you could, of course, affect a cure or a very major effect on the illness, and that's, of course, what everyone wants. But you might have a minor effect on the disease process, and everyone will say, well, okay, that's interesting. But one of the difficulties is that detecting a cure or a major effect is easy, but detecting a minor effect may be potentially difficult. And you might add, okay, well, it doesn't matter if it's so minor, that's difficult to detect, who cares? Well, the answer is because if you do have a minor effect, it may tell you that the treatment that you're using is not the answer, but it's on the right track. And if you look at the history of cancer treatment, that's pretty much what has happened. Uh, people had treatments which had minor effects, these were noted, and then these treatments were refined to the point whereby there may be major or even curative effects. Of course, when you give someone a treatment, you can have a benefit and you can have harm. Uh, these two are inseparable, at least to most allopaths like me. Homeopaths do believe that you can separate them, but I think personally that's an illusion. So if you have side effects, you have harm, they may have different significance. If you have a clinical illness uh, which is going to progress and kill you, you might put up with quite significant side effects, and indeed in cancer treatment people do do that. On the other hand, if you're perfectly well, and you may or may not develop some disease in the future, and you're going to be given something to prevent that disease, you probably want it to have rather minimal side effects. And of course, one potential harm of successful treatment, which is discussed in this area, is if you can have a treatment which halts the disease process, but the brain is left irreparably damaged and can't be repaired, uh, maybe that's in some sense a harmful treatment. Maybe that's something that you don't actually really want to do. So with those comments, I'm going to ask, OK, I've got a new treatment which I'm proposing to use. How do I evaluate it? How do I actually find out if it's any good? Well, you could do it in the laboratory at the level of protein molecules. So you look at the abnormal form of prion protein and its chemistry. You put the treatment in a test tube and you see what happens. And that's OK, but that's not a biological situation. So then you go to cells, and you grow cells in dishes, and you infect them, and you have a look at see how your treatment works uh, in the context of a functioning living cell. But that's okay. You may say, well, does it work in whole living animals? And so you turn to animal experiments. And in this area, it's usually rodents who tend to suffer, and a lot of the experiments are indeed rodent experiments. But this is the typical animal experimental methodology. You take a set of rodents and you inoculate them with infection as is shown by the red star. 
and you take another set of rodents and you inoculate them with infection and also a treatment which is denoted by the green cross. And then you follow things up over time and you look at the number of animals that become ill, you look at the incubation period, the time it takes for them to become ill, and then you kill the mice and you have a look at their brains and see how bad the pathology is. And clearly, if the number that become ill in the treatment group are fewer, and the incubation period is longer, and the pathology is less, then you have a treatment which is actually doing something. But there are some potential problems with this. First of all, this is an infection model. And indeed, many of the diseases, like sporadic CJD, are not really infections. And of course, you're doing the infection by a specific route of uncertain human significance. So most of these experiments are done in ways in which to ensure that you get a result, which means, for example, inoculating the rodent's brains with infectious material. And the question is, how does that really relate to humans? You also have to choose a particular disease to study, and many of these experiments choose diseases like scrapie, as you've heard about from sheep and goats, or other forms of disease. And the question is, are the results from one disease uh, really transferable to another disease? And then most of these experiments are done by giving the infection and the treatment either at the same time or pretty near the same time. In other words, you're looking at treatments in rodents that are either preventative or in the very early stages of disease. So does this really uh, uh, transfer easily onto humans who by the time they're diagnosed may have quite late disease? And finally, uh, far be it for me to point this out, but rodents aren't humans. And although they uh, tell you all the time uh, that uh, these mice have been transgenically manipulated, so they've now got human genes, they're still not human beings. So uh, as a clinician, for me, treating humans is the real aim, uh, and the most relevant and important experiment you could do is an experiment involving humans. Unfortunately, this is potentially the most difficult. Organising a human trial uh, contains a lot more difficulties than simply imprisoning a few mice in cages in laboratories. And I thought I'd just take you through some of this. First of all, there's what's called the problem of measurement. You can kill the mice and look at their brains. That's easy enough to do. Uh, but with humans, it's more difficult. So what you tend to do is rely on two things. One is directly observed clinical improvement. So you see what someone's like and what they can do. Uh, you then treat them and then see what they're like afterwards. And that's, to some degree, OK. And then the specific measurable disease activity markers. So, for example, in HIV and AIDS, there are tests you can do counting cells in blood samples, which tell you pretty much how they're doing. Well, if we look at directly observed clinical improvement, one of the problems, and it's not related only to CJD, we've had this with multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease and other neurological entities like stroke, the objective measurement of severe and multimodal neurological disability is fraught with all sorts of difficulties that you may not imagine until you come and try to do it. People have, of course, suggested, well, let's cut away this and just take some very simple measure, like the time it takes to reach a certain clinical point. So if people with CJD stop walking at some point, let's just measure the time to when they stop walking, because that's fairly objective. Or, if we're going to be really fairly crude about it, the time it takes for people to die, actually the length of the illness. And these measures are, of course, simple, but they will miss minor improvements, and they have other difficulties, which I'll mention in a minute. So if we had some specific measurable disease activity marker, it would be great, but at the moment, as far as I know, we don't have any of these in prion disease. There's no equivalent to taking a blood sample and measuring a certain kind of lymphocyte activity that you see in HIV. So the next problem is the problem of variability. And you have this triangle, the disease affects the individual, the treatment affects the individual, and the treatment affects the disease. And there's variability here. The way in which the disease affects people is variable, and the way in which the treatment affects people is variable. 
If we just look simply, as you've heard from Brian already, the different disease types are variable. So sporadic CJD, for example, and variant CJD and genetic CJD tend to have quite different uh, clinical progressions and symptoms. So if you do any kind of study, you either have to choose one disease type or make sure that you allow for the variations in these disease types in your study. If we just say, okay, sporadic CJD is by far and away the commonest form, let's treat that. The difficulty here, as you've also heard from Brian, is variability. So even if we took a really simple experiment and said, let's look at the duration of the disease, the time it takes for people to die with sporadic CJD. Well, what we found, uh, and this is study done by Maurizio Pockery and colleagues in Europe, is that these graphs here, as you go along the bottom axis outwards, time is increasing, and as you go down the vertical axis, the number of people alive are decreasing. And you can see that the shape of uh, the graph as people with the illness succumb. And first of all, females succumb slower to males. Secondly, the age of onset is quite important. The older you are, the more rapidly the disease progresses, and the younger you are, the slower it progresses. You heard from Brian about 129, and this has quite a profound effect on the rapidity of disease progression, as indeed does the prion protein type. So if you're going to study sporadic CJD, you might find that somebody in your treatment group lives a lot longer than somebody who's not in your treatment group, but it may be because they're female, young, of a certain genotype and a certain protein type, and nothing to do with the treatment at all. And you have to allow for that in your study design. There's then the problem of bias. So basically, you can see benefit that isn't there. Uh, you attribute uh, spontaneous changes to treatment erroneously. And you may do this for all sorts of reasons. One is that you believe in your treatment. And another is that you clearly wish to see improvement. Uh, and this is quite an important factor in detecting particularly minor improvement. There's the problem of what are called confounding factors. And these are improvements that are not related directly to the drug. So there are lots of examples of this in uh, human treatment trials where people in a drug trial get better general care than they would have done, more regular follow-up than they would have done if they hadn't been in the trial. And therefore, they tend to do better. But it's not to do with the actual treatment. It's to do with these side issues. So what's the scientific solution to this? Well, first of all, have a trial with large numbers in it, so you even out all these bits of variability. You have a, a comparative arm, a group that's treated with something and a group that isn't treated with it, so you can compare them. You randomize people to these groups, so you don't have any internal bias as to putting, say, females in one group and males in another. And you're blinded so that the person assessing the effects of the treatment does not know whether the person's on treatment or not. And this is the standard scientific solution, the large-scale randomized control trial. So if we're to look at this, trials with large numbers need large numbers. And as you've heard, this is a relatively rare disease. So in my view, uh, if you have a treatment trial, you should, if possible, try to have one with international collaboration to include reasonable numbers of patients. Secondly, you should have either placebo-controlled or comparative groups and randomize them, but there are differences of opinion about this. Would you accept to go into a trial knowing that you might be randomly given a completely inactive treatment in a disease which is inevitably progressive and fatal. And there are lots of differences of opinion on this. But I have to say, in my view, the weight of history of treatment trials in humans, the problem of detection of minor change, and the possibility that an unknown treatment may be harmful, it's not always a question of beneficial, working or not working, it could be harmful, means that in general you really should have placebo control and randomization if you can. And what about blinding? Well, there's differences of opinion on this also, but I think actually there's a lot of evidence from history that assessment in treatment trials should be blinded. And I'm not talking only about human trials, I'm talking about rodent trials as well. One of the things that laboratory people have been particularly bad at is blinding.
Just as a historical comment, uh, since 1971, there have been over 40 reports at attempted treatments in CJD involving at least 15 different drugs. And many of these reports were bordering on useless. They contained small numbers with very poor methodological design and very few randomized controlled trials. And just as an important aside to this, a bad experiment may, of course, exclude something that is useful. It doesn't necessarily always end up with a drug that's actually useless being regarded as useful. It could be that it mistakes a drug that is useful for being useless. So good design is important. And I have to say that in recent times there have been the emergence of much better design trials uh, in CJD. So briefly, treatment possibilities. This is a very schematic form, but PRPC becomes PRPSC, but it goes through certain intermediate forms on the way. And this basic protein pathology somehow or other causes neuronal death. But actually the relationship between this uh, uh, protein abnormality and the neuronal death is not terribly clear. So you've heard that PRPC is essential for this disease, so removing PRPC might be a good idea. You've heard that PRPSC is obviously this abnormal folded protein could in some way be harmful, so tackling that may be important. But I think much more important probably is this, that the intermediate forms between PRPC and PPSC are probably more dangerous. And it's, if we're going to target therapies, it's probably at this level that people should be looking. And finally, in the end, neuronal death is what counts. The reason that people develop symptoms and become ill and die is because brain cells, neurons, die. And therefore, trying to tackle this problem of neuronal death might be really important. But I have to say that at the moment, we don't know very much about the mechanisms here. But you will hear at this meeting a little bit about some of the possible mechanisms and how they might be related to treatments. So PRPC, one thing is to have an antibody that destroys PRPC, and you'll hear something about that, I would imagine, from John Collinge at the meeting. And you will also hear a bit more about halting the process of neuronal death. One thing I would say in passing is that what really seems to be the key early event in these diseases is not a disease of the neuron itself as such, but the disease of the connection between the neurons. So these electrically active neuronal cells communicate with each other at junctions called synapses. And it seems that the earliest changes occur here, before the neurons themselves become ill and die. And the experimental evidence, without going into any detail, is that these early synaptic changes are actually potentially reversible. So actually knowing when this very early phase takes place is a much more therapeutically promising area than waiting till neurons themselves die. So early treatment is usually better, but early treatment requires early diagnosis. Do these two things really link together? Well, you can look at prevention in genetic disease, but in terms of sporadic disease, the real question, I think, is can we diagnose this sort of disease early enough to stop the disease before neurons die and people become severely disabled? I should just add that on the genetic side, there is a long-term Italian study currently progressing where doxycycline, an antibiotic, is being given to family members who are currently not ill, and they're being followed up to see if the disease develops uh, in the uh, subsequent years. This is a quite remarkable study, not least because a lot of time may have to pass by, and the full results of this experiment may exceed the professional, or indeed the biological, uh, survival of the actual people doing the trial. So I'm going to finish with a bit of a quick guide to listening to experts. Diagnosis. If people try to sell you a diagnostic test, you want to know how sensitive it is. That is, how likely is the test to be positive if you have CJD? And without going into details, this sensitivity is a function related to the test performance and the disease, those two things. On the other hand, specificity, how likely is a positive test due to CJD, 
due to CJD and not something else. That's essentially related to the test, but the context in which it's done. So sometimes people quote specificities of a, a diagnostic test, but they're talking about a value, an evaluation of that test in a very specific set of circumstances. Uh, it's not necessarily transferable to general clinical practice. So just bear in mind, test results can be false positives and they can be false negatives. Treatment? Well, the likely, the questions you should actually ask about any experimental model is what is the likely human relevance of this? Is this a test tube, cell culture, animal experiment? What effects were measured? What was the timing of the treatment in relation to the timing of infection? And was randomization and blinding used in animal experiments? It really should be, just as it is in human disease. The likely human relevance of the type of disease they've studied. If they've given a drug to animals, how could it be given to humans? The mode of administration may not be suitable for humans. And should it be studied in some form of randomized controlled trial? If it's a human treatment trial, you want to ask about what measurements they did, how they dealt with the problems of measurement, the variability in humans in the trial, and aspects of bias and confounding factors. How many people did they treat? Was it controlled? Were the two groups matched properly? Uh, were they randomized to the two groups? Was the assessment blinded? What measurements were taken? And were those measurements meaningful? You'll sometimes get treatment trials which show some sort of measurement, a change of one point on a scale of measurement that actually is statistically significant. But when you look at what that actually means, it means very little indeed. So you may think that I've been pessimistic or overcritical, but I think you need to understand the complexities and hope should always be tempered by realism. But I, as I've said earlier on, care is necessary because useless treatments could thought to be useful, but on the other hand, useful treatments could mistakenly be thought to be useless. And so with that, I will finish with a, a slide from where I come from that has no political meaning unless you wish to read something into it. <laughs>